Hello and welcome, my name is Meeplis, they, she, he, and this is literally graphic. And today we're looking at the original run of Sandman's final three volumes, namely Volume 8, World's End, Volume 9, The Kindly Ones, and Volume 10, The Wake. Cumulatively, the creative team on these volumes includes writing by Neil Gaiman, pencils by Brian Talbot, John Watkiss, Michael Allred, Michael Zuli, Shay Anton Panza, Alex Stevens, Gary Amaro, Charles Vess, Glenn Dillon, and Mark Hempel. Inks by Dick Giordano, Mark Buckingham, John Watkiss, Vince Locke, Alex Stevens, Tony Harris, Steve Leloja, and Dean Ormston. Colors by Danny Vozo, art by Vincent Locke, D. Israel, Kevin Nolan, Richard Case, Teddy Christensen, John J. Muth, and John Ridgway. Colors separated by Android Images and Digital Chameleon, letters by Todd Klein. As with the rest of this series and most Vertigo titles in general, these Sandman volumes are suggested for mature readers. Otherwise, content notes for racial slurs, car crash, Character death, essay, domestic violence, clergy, orientalism, nudity, cheating, disembowelment, negative fat stereotypes, nudity, body horror, animal sacrifice, smoking, and AIDS. Looking at the nature of the violence, a lot of it remains off-page. Obviously, circling back to the creative team, as per usual, I will only give biographical overview to people who are new to Sandman. Otherwise, we have a lot of new faces to talk about and a more bizarre cast one could not ask for. Firstly, we have Michael Allred, who, according to Wikipedia, is, quote, an American comic book artist and writer who most famous for his independent comics creations, Madman and iZombie. His style is often compared to pop art, as well as commercial and comic art of the 1950s and 1960s, end quote. He is also apparently Mormon which I had kind of wondered based off of his last name. Then Michael Zuli, who is described as, quote, an American artist known for his work as an animal and wildlife illustrator and as a comic book illustrator, end quote. His fun fact is that apparently he drew an unpublished issue of Swamp Thing in which he meets Jesus Christ. Thirdly, according to Limebeak.net, quote, Shay Anton Pensa has been active in the comics and illustration field since 1986. He has worked for companies such as Dark Horse, Marvel, Image, DC, and White Wolf Games. His most notable credits are The Butcher and Green Arrow, Neil Gaiman Sandman, Spawn, and the Judah Maccabee miniseries. End quote. Next up, Alex Stevens gets points for most unique and concerning personal website. Born in Salvador, Brazil, to a United States Air Force officer, he is a professional author, illustrator, and musician whose website outlines his spiritual biography and divides his work into the categories Christian illustration, Christian comics, secular comics that still sound very Christian to me, and editorial illustrations. I was still kind of skimming, but as a Christian myself, he definitely seems to be giving off the same vibes as the kind of people who want to condemn me to hell. So there's that. Circling back to Wikipedia, Tony Harris is apparently best known for his work on Starman, Iron Man, and Ex Machina. Nominated for 19 Eisner Awards, he has won only two. Scrolling down, Harris also has a controversy subheading that includes a rant against women cosplaying and two expensive commissions he never delivered on. One eventually refunded and one not, at least as of the writing of the Wikipedia page. A real gem, I guess. Steve Leloja, on the other hand, is described on Wikipedia as an American penciler and inker whose notable work includes Fables and Spider-Woman. Writer Larry Hama named a G.I. Joe character after him. Israel is apparently one of the pseudonyms of British cartoonist, writer, and artist Matt Brooker. Dean Ormston is also British and apparently has much more recently become the artist and co-creator of Black Hammer with Jeff Lemire. Third, new British contributor Glyn Dillon is described on Wikipedia as a costume designer, comic-slash-film storyboard-slash-concept artist who worked on The Force Awakens and Rogue One films and is best known for his graphic novel The Now of Brown. Then we have American creator Mark Hempel, best known for Gregory, The Sandman, and Tug and Buster. 
according to all knowing Wikipedia, Danish artist Teddy Christiansen is best, quote, known for his work in mystery, horror, and dark suspense-filled comics. In 2005, Christensen won an Eisner Award for Best Comic Painter for his work on Superman graphic novel It's a Bird. And finally, English comic book artist John Ridgway's style is described on Wikipedia as, quote, immediately distinctive for its unusual realism, coupled with a delicate, sketchy pencil line, the two combining to give a slightly old-fashioned look infused strongly by classic British artist Frank Hampson. This has made him ideal for illustrating strips such as the 1960s set Summer Magic and Eden Blyton's The Famous Five. But it is also a look that lends itself well to large-scale science fiction, such as Babylon 5. His portfolio incorporates Doctor Who, Zoys, The Incredible Hulk, and My Name is Chaos. Ridgeway has been responsible for creating the look for a number of series, including Hellblazer, Luke Kirby, and Junker, a sign of the high regard in which he is held by many editors. He was also the artist chosen to depict Judge Dredd without his helmet, albeit severely disfigured by an acid river in the Dead Man Saga. End quote. Keywords that came to mind reading these final three volumes. Death, stories, Fairy tale, fables, fairy, dream, patriarchy, angular, family, power, faith, and postmodernism. Moving on to summaries, not entirely unusual for this series, World's End is a balance of stories within stories and is both one overarching plot and the short stories that characters tell each other. Flipping this volume over, it is described as, quote, caught in the vortex of a reality storm, wayfarers from throughout time, myth, and the imagination converge on a mysterious inn in the world's end, the eighth volume of the complete run of the Sandman, in the tradition of Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales, as the travelers wait out the tempest that rages around them, and they share stories of the places they have been, the things they have seen, and those that they have dreamed. End quote. Next up, we have the real chunker of the set, The Kindly Ones, Quote, distraught by the kidnapping and presumed death of her son and believing Morpheus to be responsible, Lyta Hall calls the ancient wrath of the Furies down upon him. A former superheroine blames Morpheus for the death of her child and summons an ancient curse of vengeance against the Lord of Dream. The kindly ones enter his realm and force a sacrifice that will change the dream forever. End quote. And finally, the end, but only for the moment, Sandman the Wake Quote, in which the repercussions are felt. In an epilogue, William Shakespeare learns the price of getting what you want. End quote. Moving along to thinking about the art, it obviously and unsurprisingly switches up a couple of times throughout. That said, it does feel pretty 90s, plus there's a lot of ang- angular, emaciated figures bouncing around, so not my favorite thing in the universe. I don't want to go so far as to say that it was bad or rather unskilled, just not my favorite thing, although it takes the material of these volumes in interesting directions. Writing-wise, things continue to noodle on. As I've already probably said more than once, I'm not the biggest Gaiman fan on the planet, but I don't hate him either. About a month ago, someone pointed out how his family's Jewish heritage, although I guess they converted to Scientology, question mark, had really impacted his work, and while I certainly was not aware of this before, it's pretty obvious in retrospect, and put a slightly different angle on a lot of the religious references. And with Jesus reincarnating into a present, etc., This set of Sandman books was heavy on the religious references. The overall arc felt like it could have been a bit tighter, but being convoluted and overly complicated is a big part of the appeal. Then, of course, caught up in the discourse of the adaptions to audiobook and Netflix show, reading these books at the same time as I'm reading the Moore's books, and at the same time as John Green is posting about how the real interpretation of his early young adult novels is actually quite progressive, really... I quickly start feeling more than a little detached from reality. So we won't linger here long, TLDR. Woke, as currently used, means literally nothing. How people feel about creators in the present has an incredible influence on how they feel about things they created in the past. Not to say this isn't sometimes justified. A prime example being I do think that gay men being outspokenly anti-turf and pro-trans impacts my perspective on his use of trans and gender queer characters in Sandman with a heavy use of asterisk 
and caveats that he is certainly not owed approval because I do think killing off Wanda was completely unnecessary and not good. Plus, there's always the risk of charismatic people turning out to be as scummy as, for example, long-lauded, quote, a feminist Joss Whedon turned out to be. The final episode's of the show does play with some of this, but that's not even getting into any definitions or debates around so-called cancel culture, which I will not be doing. So I guess I'll just repeat again, these are not must-read books. I feel like their level of, quote, wokeness is being overstated and they actually will likely come across as pretty dated, if not downright offensive, to a percentage of readers coming to it for the first time. This is actually a good thing because it means that society has, to a certain extent, moved on and expectations are allowed to be higher. Looking at gender and sexuality, Sandman does include characters from across their respective spectrums, which is certainly a step up from DC Comics generally, which sets the standards abysmally low. Nudity is still incredibly biased and there's even a scene where one character asks the other in the scene to look away while they change and we the reader still get a glimpse of forbidden nipple, which is by far my least favorite kind of nudity. Based on my general understanding and experience with Vertigo, a lot of it probably boils down to them and their choices. Not sure how much people pushed back on it at the time, but at this point I feel like a large portion of the blame for turning every nude into either an overly sexualized Barbie or castrated Ken doll lies probably with them. Ray seems to me, as a white person, to be the part of this series that has aged the least well. I have already said this, but it keeps happening. Non-white characters are extremely exoticized in the series and are often portrayed as less, quote, civilized or powerful. Obviously, there was some attempt to change this for the Netflix release and it upset some of the thin-skinned white supremacist trolls. Good. I feel like it could have gone a bit further as, especially at the start, it still felt like light-skinned characters ruled over dark-skinned characters. Plus, overall, the representation is fairly binary slash black and white. Assuming it gets renewed, there's a chance for the diversity and characterization to get better or for it to get much worse. But circling back to the comic, which is really the focus here, I was particularly annoyed with one of the final stories, the same one as had my least favorite kind of nudity, in which Morpheus's friend Hob Gadling lectures a black woman about the horrors of the transatlantic slave trade. She tries to tell him it's all in the past and clearly not his fault, so he shouldn't feel bad about it. But obviously, although she doesn't know this, he is an immoral man who very much participated for a time and to create personal enrichment in the transatlantic slave trade. I mean, I'm sure most good people are happy that Gedling has decided to see black people as humans who he shouldn't buy and sell, but yeah, this scene was not it. Class felt largely to be one of the last things on anyone's mind. Morpheus is a god slash king. Ability and disability continued to be largely ignored, particularly physically, albeit there being a heavy dose of anti-fat bias. And that's all they wrote. It's been a very long time coming, and it's hard to believe I'm going to move on to something else for a while. But yeah, looking at my schedule, the next couple of months are going to be turned over to Alan Moore's Swamp Thing, with the first volume of Hellblazer slipped in about halfway through. But we shall see. Bye y'all, keep reading and organize to end capitalist oppression. And as always, Literally Graphic is created on land that should be given back to the traditional land holders, which in this case is, to my knowledge, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe people, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat Nation.